안녕하십니까 여러분 저는 건국대학교 박배우 교수입니다 아, 어느덧 오늘이 행사의 마지막 날입니다 여러분 모두가 3일간의 여정을 알차고 유익하게 보내셨기를 바랍니다 그럼 3일차의 첫 번째 프로그램인 기조 강연을 시작하겠습니다 미국 블루 플래닛 에너지 설립자이자 CEO이신 헹크 로저스님을 모시고 기조 강연을 청해 듣겠습니다 We are ending the use of carbon-based fuel. What's next? 라는 주제로 기조 강연을 진행해 주시겠습니다. 헹크 로저스 CEO님을 큰 박수로 맞이해 주시기 바랍니다. So a little bit about who I am. My name is Hank Rogers. Uh, I was born in the Netherlands. I lived in the Netherlands until I was 11 years old. Moved to New York City. Went to high school, junior high school and high school in New York City. which is where I first got to touch a computer. A computer changed my life. I couldn't believe how, how powerful this device was. Uh, it, to me, a computer is like a bulldozer for the mind. You think of something and the, <laughs> and the computer can do it like tens of thousands or millions of times faster and stronger. So uh, fast forward, I, I moved to Hawaii when I was 18. I spent a year. Uh, surfing and diving uh, on the North Shore of Hawaii. And then I um, read a newspaper. We can go, uh, I can study computer science at the university at night. So I started going back to the university and, uh, well, long story short, I majored in computer science and I minored in Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Does anybody know what that is? I guess so, everybody laughed. So. Um, well, anyway, I chased a girl to Japan. Live, I was living in Japan. Six years later, personal computers came into the world. And I thought, oh, this is my big chance. I can actually make a game. And uh, so I went to Akihabara, and I looked at what games they had for, for sale. And uh, there were no role-playing games. So I thought, oh my gosh, I can make a role-playing game. Now, computers at this time, the maximum memory was 64K. <laughs> 64K. I don't know, today you can't even have one piece of graphic in 64K, but I wrote a role-playing game in 64K. It had a 3D, it had pictures of little monsters, it had a little bit of a story, 64K. I still can't believe I did this. I, I had no idea what I was getting into. Well, I was looking for a way to published this game, and uh, I went to SoftBank, and SoftBank was at that time just a very small company. And they said, um, you know what, you can publish this game yourself. All you have to do is get your wife to answer the phone when we order more. Uh, of course, that was not true. <laughs> There was a lot of work. Uh, we started the company, uh, but I, I published the, uh, Black Onyx, my first game, Uh, I made two games for the company, and then I realized, because I was programming day and night, that I never got to see my children. And so I said, you know what, I can't be making games for the rest of my life. It's, it's too hard. It's too much work. So I switched to running the company, and uh, so what did I do to get games instead of making them myself? Um, I started traveling around the world uh, looking for games, to bring to Japan. Uh, I went to Consumer Electronics Show, I went to England to the Computer Game Show in England, all over. And uh, at the Consumer Electronics Show in 1988, I found a little game called Tetris. Okay, so Dr. Lee taught me something yesterday. So all of you who have played Tetris, please stand up. Wow, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you, you can sit down. <laughs> so I published Tetris on, uh, uh, on eight different personal computers and on the Nintendo family computer in Japan in 1988. And that was the year that Game Boy was going to come out. Nintendo announced it. And I thought, oh my goodness, Tetris is the perfect game for Game Boy. So I searched around and uh, found out that the rights are in Moscow. 
So in February of 1989, with a tourist visa, I got on a plane and I went to Moscow to look for whoever has the rights to Tetris in Moscow. All right, so recently, a couple of months ago actually, uh, a movie came out about my trip to Moscow. It's on Apple TV Plus. So I'm not a movie star, but somebody's a movie star and he's playing me. So it's kind of something like a movie star, I guess. Um, so if you want to watch the movie, then you can find the story about me going to, um, to Moscow. And I really don't want to take up too much time about that today because I have important things to talk about. So um, fast forward, um, I started a comp another company. I've started many companies many companies, and many failed, but a couple made me money, so I'm plus. The one that made me really plus was a, uh, a company that I started in Hawaii to make games for mobile phones. I started this company in 2002. Um, by the way, I tried to license Tetris. That was my business, licensing Tetris at that point. I tried to license Tetris to a company in the US for mobile phones, and the biggest offer I got was $25,000. Now, I had already made a deal in Japan to sell Tetris for a million dollars, because games were already happening. Phones that could play games were already popular in Japan, but they hadn't come out in the US yet. So I thought, okay, nobody understands what's going to happen in the US, so I'll do it myself. So I started the company in 2002, Three years later, I sold, that, I sold my company to the company that offered me $25,000. They went public. I sold my company to them for over $100 million. So <laughs> they could have licensed. <laughs> yeah. So a month after I sold my company, um, I found myself in the back of an ambulance mm. with a heart attack. I had 100% blockage of the Widowmaker. And in, I'm lying in the ambulance and I'm thinking, first thing I thought is like, you've got to be kidding me. I haven't spent any of the money yet. <laughs> that was my first thought. And my second thought was, no, I'm not going. I still have stuff to do. So obviously I survived. I have two stents. It's no big deal. The doctor said, don't change anything. Don't change your diet. Don't change your exercise. Everything is fine. OK. Fine, so, but what did I mean by stuff? So I started thinking, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, so I've already got enough money so my wife doesn't need me anymore. <laughs> I, I, all my children already graduated from university so they don't need me anymore, they're, they're done. So what's stuff? And so I thought about it. Um, what is it that's going to upset me at the end of my life if I didn't do something about it. I, I believe that, that uh, the last moments of your life, when you look back on your life, you think about what did I do and what did I not do. And if you come up with many things that you did not do, I believe that that's hell. And if you come and think about all the great things that you did, I believe that that's heaven. So how do we make heaven for ourselves? We do the things that we think need to be done in our lifetimes. So I thought about my bucket list. I thought about um, my missions in life. The first mission came to me in the, in the back of a, a newspaper. It's a Hawaiian newspaper. It said, oh, by the way, we're going to kill all the coral in the world by the end of the century. I said, what? What's causing that? Ocean acidification. What's causing that? Carbon dioxide. What's causing that? We are. We are. The article, which is in the back of the newspaper in Hawaii, this is Hawaii. Coral should be the most important thing in Hawaii. It's in the back of the newspaper. It said, we are killing all the coral in the world by the end of the century. And I said, no, we're not. We're not going to do this. So mission number one is to end the use of carbon-based fuel. That's my first mission. So I'm living in Hawaii at this, at this time. And so how am I going to do this? 
Well, first of all, I'm going to clean up my own room. Hawaii is my room, so I'm going to end the use of carbon-based fuel in Hawaii. And at, at the time, it sounded like a huge job. So this huge job, how, what, is, what does it entail? So Hawaii, at that point in time, imported $5 billion a year of oil and a billion dollars of coal. 30% of the oil goes to jet fuel, 30% goes to ground transportation, gasoline and diesel. 40% goes to electricity. That's $2 billion plus a billion dollars of coal. That's a billion dollars. I was setting out to end a billion dollar, a $3 billion industry. The utility is the biggest company in Hawaii. And they, um, they're the most, how can I say, hated company in Hawaii because we have the highest energy costs in the country. And they are burning oil and coal, so nobody likes them. And they always say something about, we're doing this and this and this, but this is called greenwashing. They're not actually making any progress. So um, we decided that we would pass a law in Hawaii that says Hawaii must go 100% renewable energy by 2045. How do we do this? Well, the, 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 we went to the politician. I went to the governor and said, we should do this. And the, the governor goes, what are you talking about? You know, this is how we make electricity. We went to the utility, and the, the, the utility says, what are you talking about? This is how we make electricity. So finally, we, we figured out, OK, we got to get the people on our side. And we tried everything to get the people on our side. The first, first thing we did is get the children. We had elementary school children go door to door and exchange 300,000 light bulbs. In, the, in so doing, they had to have a conversation with the person in the house about energy efficiency, because LEDs is, you know, only use 10% of the electricity of, of incandescent, and that this is helping for their future, because we're reducing the amount of carbon uh, dioxide is produced for this electricity. Well, uh, our biggest success came in 2015. We were the first state in the, in the country to have a 100% renewable energy by 2045 mandate. This is a law. This means in 2045, if there are any fossil fuel generating plants, they will be shut off in 2045. This, what it really means is that the electric company is not going to build any more fossil fuel infrastructure because they, they can't, it can't run past 2045. Well, we followed it up. We, we changed the business model of the utility. And the business model of the utility used to be 10% on the price of oil, which is price of oil is, is something like 25 cents per kilowatt hour. They get to make two and a half cents. So what we did is said, OK, what's the price of renewables? Well, wind and solar are only 8 cents per kilowatt hour. If you add storage, now we're all the way up to 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So we said to the utility, you can make more money by switching to renewables. So maybe you can make 3 cents instead of 2.5 cents. Oh, are you kidding me? The electric company just went crazy. We are, our original target for 2030 was 40% renewable energy. We have already reached our 2030 target today. So we're moving much faster than anybody expected, including the politician, including the, the electric company, everybody involved. I was on a panel once, and I'm, I'm, you know, I, I announced we were going to go 100% by 2045. And next to me was, uh, I don't know, a professor from the university. He said, uh, this is what I study at the university. There is no way we can go 100% by 2045. <laughs> And I was kind of flabbergasted. And I, I said, well, I'm, I'm not as smart as this guy, so I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and I, this is, I'm not saying something bad about him. I'm, you know, he studied the past. And if you look at the rate of change in the past, it's so slow that we cannot imagine that we can have faster change in the future. But change is happening 
very, very fast. Very fast. So um, since then, 20 other states have copied our legislation. 20 others. The next state was California. California also has a main mandate of 100% by 2045. If it was a country, it would be the sixth largest economy in the world. And now, with all with the 20 states, we have over 50% of the people in the United States have a mandate. But even if we're completely successful in the US, that's only, I don't know, 6% of the population of the world. So what we need to do is do the same thing outside the United States. And so I moved to New York, started a new organization called the Blue Planet Alliance to do what we did inside the United States outside. And we're starting with island countries. So last year we signed up Tonga, Tuvalu, Palau, and this year we probably got 10 other countries that we're signing up. And it should be more and more and more. We want to get the domino effect happening outside, outside the United States, in the world. And I'd, I would like Korea to be one of those countries that says 100%. Who can make that happen? Oh, OK, he can make that happen. That's good. Mm. So how did I end up here talking on this stage? I have a good friend, friend Dr. Tysik Lee. Thank you very much. So, so, so how do I know Dr. Lee? I, um, uh, mission number three. It's mission number three. I have an, uh, mission number three is to make a backup of life by going to other planets. Why on earth would you want to do that? My daughter says, Pops, why do you want to go to another planet? You know? And I said, well, we should go and, and we should colonize. He said, look. We have done such terrible things with colonization on this planet. Look at everything. It's just messed up because of colonization. Uh, and so I started thinking about this. And uh, I think the word colonization is, um, how can I say? It's a word that has become a bad word. If you go back in time before, before Christopher Columbus or before Europeans went around the world, um, colonization meant that we, we humans went to some place where there were no humans and we colonized. And when we colonized, every place that we lived, we learned how to live in harmony with nature because it was the only way to survive. Meaning that we didn't take more from nature than nature was able to give us. Then, fast forward, we start the second wave of colonization, which I don't think is called colonization. It was conquest. We, well, Europeans, conquered many other places. Why? So they could take their resources back home and become rich. And that's just a terrible thing to do. They looked at the people that were there, and they said, well, those aren't really people. They're savages. And I, it's just a, a mind frame, and we're just barely getting over it. There's still places in the world where people are, how can I say, looked at differently because of the color of their skin, which is a very strange thing. I mean, it's just a very strange thing. So why do we want to go to the moon? I, I believe that nature tries to live everywhere it can live on this planet meaning in the coldest place, in the hottest place, at the bottom of the ocean, at the top of the mountain. Nature lives everywhere. I think it's the same thing goes for human beings. Human beings live in all these interesting places, difficult places, dry places, cold places, wet places, even dangerous places. They're, they're everywhere. We are everywhere. I think this is in our DNA. It's a basic function of DNA that makes us want to go to, to dangerous or extreme uh, conditions and survive there. Now, why is that? I believe that if things change drastically, some of us will survive because we already know how to live in the drastic situation. If the entire planet became a desert, desert people would then re would then repopulate the earth. And the same thing goes for animals. I've been in the hottest places. I was in the Namibia desert, and, and I was in Antarctica. 
And there are animals there. If the whole world turned into Antarctica, penguins would be everywhere. So, so then let's think about what that means. Well, I, I kind of think about all of life on Earth as one thing. I call it Gaia, or I, I like to call it Mother Nature. Mother Nature, because Mother Nature made us. Mother Nature, I believe Mother Nature is pregnant, and we are it. We are the way that Mother Nature has a baby. If you look at all the planets anywhere near us, there is no life as we know it anywhere. We haven't found any. It's us that takes Mother Nature, that takes life as we know to other planets. So if you need a reason for humans to exist, this is the reason. And if you look at all the damage that we're doing this plan to this planet and the, and the temperatures going up, this is all part of pregnancy. After she has her baby, another planet somewhere else, everything will go back to normal. But that doesn't happen automatically. That doesn't happen automatically. We, the people who live on this planet, have to figure out how to reduce the temperature of the planet. We have to reduce, we have to lower the sea level to where it's supposed to be. We have to, our job is to take back everything or to put back everything that we've taken from nature. Everything, we need to put it back. All of the plastic in the ocean, we need to take it back. All of the carbon dioxide that we've put into the atmosphere, we need to take it back. All the garbage that we, the waste, that we've put into landfills, we need to put it back. We need to take it. You know, people say, okay, well, we've used, we're using too much water. All the water that we've ever used is still here. All the iron that we've ever mined is still here. We haven't lost anything. Now, maybe there's a couple of rockets we sent to space, but everything else that we've ever done with anything is still here which means we have all the raw materials that we need to do whatever we need to do in the future. We will be mining the landfills for raw materials because it's all there. We don't have to scrape the mountains anymore. So the future is that we have to rebuild nature. We have to let nature live I heard somebody say at least 50% of the world should be left to nature. I like that a lot. So, why are we here and who are we? My understanding is that I'm in a room full of scientists and engineers. And these are the scientists and engineers that are going to figure out how to do that. How do we use all that material that we've dumped into the ground? How do we take back the carbon dioxide? How do we end, get the plastic out of the ocean? And how do we rebuild nature? This is your job. This is your job. So right now, at the United Nations, we are in the uh, sustainable development goals in that time period. And the Sustainable de Development Goals, we're supposed to live in balance. But I mean, we can't be sustainable until we take it all back. So I believe that once we have the finish of the Sustainable Development Goals, which last from 2015 to 2030, we move on to the next 15 years, and that will be the Regenerative Development Goals. It's the 15 years where we put back everything that we've taken, where we fix everything that we've broken. In 2045, which is the 100th anniversary of the United Nations, I want us to have fixed everything. If we don't have a deadline to fix things, it never happens. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And as you can see in my example in Hawaii, we had a, a, a deadline of 2045, but when we start working on it, we realize we can do this much, much quicker. Why? Because of people like you. Because you can do this. We can do this. 
We can fix everything. We can fix everything in the world. And people ask me, they ask me, so do you have hope for the future? And I say, no, I don't have hope. I have determination because we are doing this. We are doing this. Can you repeat after me? We are doing this. We are doing this. We are doing this. We are doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you.